Okay, welcome everyone. We're gonna let people filter in a little bit and get started in about a minute or so. So we've got, um, we're about to go live. Yes. All right. Thirty-two. All right, I think we're good to get started. Um, I'm sure more people will join us. Um, I want to welcome everybody to BMFA Fridays After Five, A Taste of Art, um, presented by Chase. We're really excited to have our first beer tasting. Uh, we've had two wine tastings, so this is our first one, and just couldn't be more delighted to have Virginia Beer Company with us to kick that off. Uh, my name is Celeste Feta. I'm Director of Education at the museum, and joining me is Michael Rhodes, Director of Sales from the Virginia Beer Company, and... And Robbie Willie, our co-founder, our illustrious co-founder. Um, he was able to steal away, and I was able to grab him for this event, so we're super, we're super excited to be here. Great, thank you so much. Good to meet you. Um, all right, so we're gonna do first just a little logistics, um, just to talk about how we'll move through the tasting. Um, if you are pairing um, the selections, uh, the beer selections with us, recommend just opening those now. Um, also recommended is grabbing a clear glass and pouring the beer into the glass as each one of them is introduced. So um, that will allow you to just see it I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about the beer part. You guys got that one. Uh, so you can describe what that does uh, for us <laughs> when we get there. Um, also as a reminder, um, this is a webinar format, which means that you can see us, but we cannot see you. So uh, use that to your advantage as you like. Um, we'll also be um, really wanting to approach this as a conversation and, and as much as kind of replicating that in-person experience. So asking for your impressions of the beer and the art. And so if you want to share those, or if you have um, questions, we're going to be using the chat feature as opposed to the Q&A feature. And that's located at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or if it's on your phone or iPad, just look for that chat icon and pull that up. You can type in comments, um, questions to all the panelists. Um, if you want to get specific, you can do that to a specific panelist. And those instructions are there for you. Um, or just, you know, any kind of question that you like within reason. And uh, both um, myself and Michael will kind of keep an eye on that chat and ask those questions aloud um, or say, hey, you know, there's a question about this X, Y, Z and try to get to all of them. Um, some people in the past have used a raise hand feature. I can't get to that feature. Uh, so please just go ahead and type it in the chat um, if you can. So if everyone feels good about um, those sort of uh, instructions and logistics, uh, we're gonna get started. And as a reminder too, um, we'll talk about the beer and then I'll talk about a related work of art and then go back to the next selection and kind of ping pong back and forth. And that's how we'll, we'll go through the tasting. Um, so let me switch on over and, um, you know, Michael, uh, let me know when you'd like this slide to advance and I can go ahead and do that. Oh, okay, so, sure. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Virginia Beer Company to talk about Great. who they are and what they make. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Celeste. Uh, my name is Michael Rhodes. I'm the Director of Sales for Virginia Beer Company. We are based out of Williamsburg, Virginia, where we brew. Uh, to my right is Robbie Willie, one of our co-founders of Virginia Beer Company is his brainchild. I'm actually, um, 
I'm gonna turn this segment over to him initially to give a little history about the brewery. Um, it is obviously his baby. So I'm sure he'll have uh, some inter interesting stories and I'll interject as well as uh, Celeste scrolls through some of the photos that'll uh, give you a, a clear idea of what our space is like in Williamsburg and some of the beers that we brew and our brand overall. So Robbie. Oh, thank you for the wonderful introduction, Michael. And thank you everyone for tuning in for happy hour today. Um, so like Michael said, my name is Robbie. I'm one of the co-founders of the Virginia <laughs> Beer Company. It's definitely a, uh, uh, been a group effort to uh, pursue this dream of ours. So I first um, came up with the idea along with my business partner who um, I met at the College of William & Mary, which is a big reason that we opened the brewery at Go Tribe. I hear a couple of alums on here. Um, so Chris and I and his wife, Erin, all met at the college and decided that we wanted to work together. Uh, we love the idea of coming back to Williamsburg, um, getting more involved in the college community as well as the greater Williamsburg community. And we love the idea of doing it over beers. So um, it seemed like a really good idea to two college best friends quitting their, their careers in finance and moving back to their college towns to open a brewery. What could go wrong, right? <laughs> um, luckily, things have gone really well. It took us a little while to get open. We moved back in 2012 and it took us four years to really get the whole thing started. But we found a great brewmaster along the way. He joined us from Sweetwater Brewing in Atlanta and he was a much better brewer than Chris and I ever were. So um, we realized very quickly that no one was going to pay for our beer unless we had a uh, really good beer. And that's where Jonathan came in. Uh, and then we've had a wonderful team that we've built around us. So the picture here is our production team. Jonathan's wearing the hat um, to the right. And then um, two guys on the left, Brad and AJ are two of our brewers and our uh, lead cellarman packaging technician, Jeremy. Um, so all of that beer that you've got in your hands today is in large part due to their efforts. And then I've got to give the shout out to Mr. Michael Rhodes here. He's, he's our director of sales, but that makes it sound like a really big company. We're not that <laughs> big. We've got, we've got 15 staff members total, including part-timers and including myself and my business partner. Uh, Michael's director of sales. He's literally a department of one. Um, so I, I don't know if that says something about his title or something about our company. But, right. <laughs> but if, if, if that beer has gotten to you in Richmond, it's because Michael has gone up and worked with our partners at Premium who've done a great job getting our beer out into the wild in the greater Richmond area. So we've got a wonderful team. Um, the brewery <laughs> is located in downtown Williamsburg, just about a mile from Colonial Williamsburg. We're in an old 1960s built building. It was an old car shop. Um, so it's got a big roll up garage door when you walk up and then we've got a wonderful outdoor beer garden space, which has obviously helped us during the pandemic to be able to, to go outside and spread out. So we, we love our space. It's very, it feels very Williamsburg to have taken over an old uh, out of use space and, and put it back into use in, in, in modern times. So um, 2000 square foot beer garden, 2000 square foot tap room, the rest of the space is all production. So right now, four years in, uh, we currently distribute our beers in the Hampton Roads area. We distribute our beers in the Richmond area, and we are now distributing our beers in Northern Virginia. So that stack of beers you see there was our first case stack that landed at a Wegmans in Northern Virginia. So for us, it's a big deal. I'm actually from Herndon originally in Northern Virginia, so it's been kind of a prideful moment for me to be able to finally start sending my family and friends in Nova out to get the beers a little closer to home. Um, and then we're, we have kind of a unique model. So we're, we're two breweries within one. We have a, a larger system that allows us to produce larger batches of, of the, the beer we're about to sample today. But we also have a small system that allows us to use the tap room as a test kitchen. So we, we this year, I think we've canned almost 100 different recipes. Um, and last year with 12 months time, we canned like 70. Mm -hmm. So we're way ahead of pace. We're brewing more and more than ever before using that five barrel system to can beers, to get people to come in and try stuff and give us feedback. And if something does really well, if we get a lot of positive feedback, we might bump it up to a larger scale and, and ship it out beyond Williamsburg. So it's really fun to let the community come in and tell us what they would like to see. And that really helps our brewers to come up with recipes that might hit the wild later on. So, so please be um, honest with us. Tell us what you like. Tell us what flavors you're looking for, because we, we are we are here to share beers and cheers. And we, we want to put beers out there that you're going to like. Um, and, and a cool fun fact about us, being a small brewery, you know, we're four and a half years old. We've got about 15 um, team members. Uh, relatively small in the grand scheme of things, but we are actually distributing our beer around the world. So uh, a passion of my business partners, he's, he's a very, uh, he's got a very international background, multiple passports. I think he's a secret agent in reality. <laughs> um, he always wanted to send beer over to his family overseas. He's got family in the UK, family in Canada, family in Europe. And so we have worked really closely with the state of Virginia over the past three years now. Um, to, to work through trade agreements to get our beers overseas. So we're currently in the mid process of sending our second shipment of beer to the UK. Uh, we've been sending beer to the Netherlands for the past few years now. We just sent our second shipment to France and we uh, 
were lucky enough last year to take a trip to Tokyo to promote uh, Virginia beer in Tokyo. So we're in Japan as well. Um, so it's, it's been a really interesting experience to be a smaller brewery, to not even cover the entire state of Virginia, but to be able to share the quality of Virginia craft beer overseas um, and really showcase what's going on in Virginia, which I think is a cutting edge brewing state. It has been a lot of fun. So we're, we're trying to uh, make the most of our, our time in Williamsburg here. And we, we look forward to sharing some beers and cheers here. Uh, one thing that I'll just interject quickly, uh, uh, and you can move on to that slide if you like, Celeste. Uh, Robbie touched on it briefly, uh, but our, our building is um, historic in its own way. It definitely has a past and a, and a very tangible history when you're in that space. And I really think that that carries through to our branding and everything. It really acknowledges um, the past with a look toward the future. Uh, Celeste was commenting on our branding earlier and how it had somewhat of a retro feel with a modern twist. I would I would agree with that, and it's one of the things I'm most proud of when I when I see our brand on the shelf. And I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll throw on top of that before we jump into the first beer here. And by all means, if you crack this one open, feel free to start sipping it. We don't yeah. want to hold you back from yeah, the happy yeah. hour <laughs> here. Uh, I I know I'm I'm already partaking, so follow my lead, please. Um, but I will say, from a branding standpoint, if you look at the shape of the logo on the can, and if you've got the can in front of you, you know, give it a quick turn to see the full shape. But the shape is actually. Um, the hull of the Chesapeake Bay Dead Rise, which is the state boat of Virginia. And so we wanted to throw some Virginia imagery kind of subtly into our branding. And then the way that the word Virginia has a little arc, uh, the way that the words droop from the left to the right um, is actually the arc of the Crimdale Bridge, which is a, a famous bridge here on William & Mary's campus, the Lover's Bridge. And um, it's actually the bridge where the most, the most uh, cliche William & Mary thing ever I proposed to my fiance on the bridge but that's that's what you're supposed to do you hold hands with with your your loved one on that bridge and it means you'll be together forever so we um specifically tried to put some williamsburg imagery and some state of virginia imagery and then the fact that our building is an old um, auto body shop we really wanted the the label to kind of look like an old gasoline sign too so it, it gives us a sense of place both from the state from williamsburg and from our actual address at 401 second street and I think the more you get into craft beer, um, admiring the labels, not just our brewery, but all the wonderful breweries in the Richmond area, throughout the state and the country and the world, there's, there's usually a story behind a lot of what you're seeing on the cans and the bottles. So definitely dig into those websites and look at the social media and ask questions because um, I don't want to sound cliche by saying beer is art, but there's something mm -hmm. to be said for, you know, really soaking it in with your eyes before you soak it in with your palate. And I, I think it's a fun way to get to, to get to know your breweries better. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more um, and, and making that comparison. I just love the look of the can and the, the, the labeling. I just, you know, I could just look at this like all night <laughs> and then drink it. I mean, right. it's definitely my, the aesthetic I, I gravitate towards. And I, and I think, you know, getting that story behind it, you know, that's something that we really um, love and kind of drives us, you know, when we're as educators, when we're thinking about the art here um, and telling that behind the scenes story, but also connecting with the people who we're talking to and, and looking at it and hearing their stories as well. So um, I appreciate that effort uh, with, with your labeling. Um, I actually you. have two questions that have popped up if we can sure. answer this before we start. Um, so William um, asked, are your beers available in Chicago? So our, our beers are not available in Chicago yet. Um, we, we do have some, some ties to Chicago. So my, my business partner, uh, his, Chris, his brother, Ben, actually had a, a pretty distinguished stint in the NHL, and he, he helped win a uh, Stanley Cup with the Chicago Blackhawks a few years back. So he's no, he's no longer with the Blackhawks. He's playing over in Europe now, but um, we, we definitely have a, a, a sincere appreciation for the Chicago craft beer scene. Um, we've definitely talked to some uh, distributors out in that area. Um, we just haven't quite made it far enough into – any sort of formal agreement. The, the farthest away domestically that our beer is available is actually New York. We recently signed with a distributor in New York. And so you can actually find our, our beers in bars and restaurants in New York, uh, the whole state, as well as available for home delivery in New York state. So if that, that we're hopeful that if that model succeeds that we might be able to extend that beyond New York state to some of the other states and um, states that we have connections with uh, Connecticut, our business, my business partner and his wife both from Connecticut, um, like I said, Chicago and Illinois etc. So we're, we're hopeful that we can keep expanding. And one of the keys for us is that we've invested heavily beyond a brewery of our size in our lab equipment, which helps to guarantee the quality of the beer. So we're really meticulous about our growth. And I know it sounds kind of crazy since we're sending beer to Japan, 
but we wouldn't send beer to Japan if we weren't comfortable with the quality of the beer once it arrived there. And the fact that Chris and I were able to go to Tokyo last year and actually sample the beer once it arrived and talk to the buyers over there about how it should be treated. Um, we're trying to do that meticulously with all of our distributors, which is part of the reason too, we're not available everywhere in Virginia yet. So we hope to get to Chicago sooner than later. Uh, it's definitely on our radar. Great. William says sweet. So that's a good answer. He's having yeah. a good answer. Um, then the next question, um, we're about working with your beer, like pouring beer. So is there really a correct way to pour beer? So yes, actually, I was just about to say that. So perfect timing. If you have your liquid escape handy, uh, please, if it's open already, we can pour it out. Um, I think the common way that you see most people pour beer is very cautiously, carefully down the edge of a tilted glass. Um, it minimizes the amount of head and foam at the top to overflow. But in reality, um, a harder pour on beer is actually very good for the beer, particularly craft beer, because when you do a harder pour, which I'm going to demonstrate now, and let it sit for a moment, uh, the carbonation opens up the beer and it opens up the nose of the beer, much like you would experience a wine. A beer has a nose, it has legs, and um, it's going to open up the entire uh, drinking experience. So a harder pour is preferred into a nice, clean, clear glass so that you can see the color of the beer that you're about to consume. So that would be the preferred method, particularly for craft beer. Um, I won't lie that this beer in particular, I've consumed straight from the can on the beach. <laughs> um, and that's okay too. Uh, we're, uh, whatever your comfort level is. But if you are gonna pour it into a glass, a harder pour, a pause, let it settle, and then pour some more to open up the flavors of the beer is probably the preferred and uh, best way to really experience that beer before you take your first sip. And you'll, you'll see, if you, if you come to the brewery, and I think most breweries, if you, if you pay attention to um, how we pour at the brewery too, so we often don't have as much time to let the beer sit, and obviously we're pouring from taps and not cans in most cases. So you'll see us pour down the side for the first you know, three quarters of the pour, but specifically for the end of the pour, we'll be pouring straight into the middle of the cup. And that's to do what Michael just described, to open, okay. to open the beer up, to, to have a little head. A lot of people think that head on a beer is, is, is wasted space, and that's really not the case. I mean, certainly there's a, there's a certain amount of head that might be wasted space, but, but having you know, a, a finger or two of, of head at the top of your beer means A, the beer is fresh, and B, that's where you get some of that aromas as the beer is settling. So you'll, you'll see us pouring down the side for speed, but we always make sure we leave a little room at the top to pour straight in the middle to really get the beer speaking to you um, before you get it in your hands so that you can smell it before you put it to your lips. Feel so free. speaking of kind of smell, I'm just noticing um, lemongrass and sea salt as part of kind of the, the description of, of this tart ale. Yes. So could you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. And um, and I'll kind of pop in another question as you're doing that is, is uh, from Harlan, <laughs> like cans and not bottles. Okay. And then I also have someone saying like, itching to see some artwork. So um, yeah, as, we yeah, answer, sure. as we explore those two things, uh, I might switch over to um, the work and, and we can go back and forth a little bit. Oh, nice. Yeah. So uh, briefly, this beer is actually the newest addition to our core lineup. We have four beers that we brew year round that are available all the time. Uh, this is the newest edition. It's about a year old in our portfolio. We retired an Amber Ale uh, a little more than a year ago and really tried to look to the future of what modern craft beer consumers were looking for. Uh, we didn't have uh, anything that was tart or sourish in our uh, year round portfolio. And um, they are those kinds of beers are definitely um, experiencing a, a big rise in popularity at the moment. So we felt that this set us apart and uh, was a very modern take on that style of beer and filled a void that really was not widely available from local craft breweries. So we build this as a tart ale. Uh, in fact, it is a, a true sour ale. It is kettle soured, um, but we build it as a tart ale for a couple of reasons. One, we don't want to confuse the consumer um, and oversell the sour component. And that's because two, we brew it in two batches, one being soured and the second batch not being soured and then blended. 
to create a very, very light on the touch to your palate drinking experience. It's a supremely drinkable, very light beer. The lemongrass comes forward on the nose. It's the first thing you catch on the palate. Mm. And then the sea salt and just a slight tart on the finish makes it a really drinkable beer. It's 4.4%, um, very approachable and accessible beer. Even folks that don't normally drink beer love this. This has very, <laughs> been very popular in the tap room with the, the craft beer fans significant of <laughs> that tags a lot. So enjoy this beer. And I know Celeste has some great art uh, that she's paired with this uh, selection. Yeah, thanks. And I've got Althea saying um, she loves the aroma of Liquid Escape. So you're right, kind of getting that that lemongrass right on the front. Um, and the um, art I paired with, so when Michael and I were, he was telling me about these beers and I was, you know, learning, I was really taken with this idea of mixing like one tart and not, you know, one sour and not sour together. Um, and the overall theme for tonight, because we're so close to Halloween, is thinking about kind of spooky things and otherworldly things, um, um, things that go bump in the night and uh, trying to kind of pair these with, the, with these beers. So when I think about mixing and just concocting something very unusual, um, I selected this, this work from our decorative arts collection called the Sorcerer's Necklace. Um, and it's by an artist named Eugene uh, Grasset um, and made for the Maison Vevey, uh, Vevey firm. Um, and he was an um, interesting guy. So he, and I'll show you a picture of him, although we were joking, like every guy from the turn of the century looks the same. So <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the left is Mr. Uh, Grasset and on the right is um, Henri Vive, and he was um, the founder of the firm. So they worked together, again, sort of kind of the, the artist and the businessman, right? Um, it kind of sounds familiar. So if you think about, think about like your brewery, so there's the brewer and the owners and they're all working together to create something beautiful, right? So um, Grasset um, was a printmaker and then he turned to jewelry design and did a, in the Art Nouveau style, um, and here's um, the jewelry again, the, the necklace is on the right and on the left is an example of his print work. So this is, I picked October. So this is from the series of months uh, plates that he did for the months of the year. The color scheme is very similar to both of these works. Um, so pulling in these kind of chartreuse colors and um, oranges and mixing those together um, in both color palettes is pretty predominant. On the necklace, um, this, this idea of kind of the Art Nouveau woman is very prominent and clear. So kind of um, attenuated figures and really long hair. You see those kind of locks flowing into one another. Um, and it's sort of like the light and the dark. Um, if anyone has seen Practical Magic, the movie, um, that to me, this is like, a forerunner of that film. So Sandra Bullock and um, um, Nicole Kidman, anyway, that's just a really hot, like a Halloween film uh, nod for everybody. Um, but it's it's a big pendant. I mean, this is big. So this is, you know, a couple, couple inches long. Um, and it was purchased by um, a guy named Charles Guillet for his wife, Marie. So directly from the 1900 fair. Um, and she probably again wore this, um, but it's pretty, it's pretty out there, you know, for the turn of the century. If you, if you look at the woman on the left and that's not what I look like when I rake, but you know, she, um, she is pretty tame in terms of kind of her wardrobe. So if you think about that versus this, it's, it's pretty daring um, to wear something like that, this, that is pretty, it's kind of beautiful and scary at the same time. You know, they've got really grimacing faces. They look like they're struggling with one another, but they're definitely kind of the same form of person, but just mixed together to create this amazing uh, work of art. So that's the impression I got from, from this beer um, in itself as well. All right, so let's, let's talk about free verse. Sure. We find ourselves talking about free verse pretty much all the time. It is, <laughs> it is our bestseller, which is not a huge surprise because IPAs and beer pale ales continue to be some of the top selling styles around the country. Uh, it's been the case for quite some time. There, there, there have been some changing trends. Um, alternative beverages are starting to 
pick up uh, seltzers in particular, but from a from a true beer and specifically craft beer segment, uh, India Pale Ales, the, the hop forward side of brewing continues to dominate. Um, and Freeverse for us makes up like half of our production in terms of our, our time spent uh, brewing and distributing and packaging. So uh, we hope you enjoy this one as much as everyone else seems to. <laughs> right. Uh, so as Robbie mentioned, it is, it's our best seller. It is our workhorse. Um, not shocking when you think about uh, the trends in craft beer. Uh, probably the most common question that I hear in the market and certainly in the tap room is why so many IPAs? And uh, the, the short answer is that because they sell, but the more uh, involved answer is that when you look at the hundreds, I mean, maybe thousands of styles uh, of beer that you could choose from, IPAs make up more than 65% of the craft beer consumer uh, as far as the, kind of the style of beer they consume. For one style to garner that much market share is pretty impressive. So uh, it would be crazy for us not to follow suit and offer our take on a modern IPA. Um, and when I say modern IPA, it's uh, we, we joke often that this is the IPA for folks that don't normally like IPAs or don't think they like IPAs. Um, however, this is a, definitely a gateway India Pale Ale. And I say that because um, I think folks have a, a preconceived notion about IPAs that they're going to be extremely bitter on the palate, uh, which is true of old school or West Coast style IPAs. Um, the, top of, the type of hop varietals that were predominantly used in this style of beer eight, nine, 10 years ago and, beyond, and before uh, were those kinds of highly bittered, bittering hops. Um, a more modern take tends to lean more toward the hazy and juicy. And that's definitely how I would describe Freebirds. Um, it's tropical and juicy. Those are the two words I use all the time. Um, there's a nice note of mango on the nose. You get mango and pineapple. Um, it's a beautiful color in the glass. Mm. And uh, when you drink it, you don't get that bitterness on the front end. It's big, bright juicy fruit notes, even though there is no fruit in the beer, and then does have some pleasing residual bitterness on the finish, as you would expect from an IPA. So altogether, it creates a very unique IPA drinking experience. I find this beer super approachable, and I attribute most of the success of this beer to its crossover appeal. Mm. Um, folks that are shy about an IPA, but are willing to give it a try, fall in love with this beer. And folks that adore IPAs also love this beer. It's dry hopped to three pounds per barrel. So it's a very generously hopped beer, but because of uh, the Azaka and Chinook that we use, primarily the Azaka brings forward all of those big fruit notes that you get. And it just changes the experience entirely. and makes for a very, um, unique IPA drinking experience. So I hope you enjoy this. Um, it's a very popular beer. It's the beer you're most likely to see from us out and about in restaurants, bars, and on shelves. So um, cheers, please enjoy. And I'm wondering too, I think the name of this has kind of a cool uh, background story too. Can I get the- sure. Yeah, and that's a, that's a, that? a, you read my mind. So I was literally <laughs> going to interject with a quick uh, anecdote about the name. and. We oftentimes get asked because every beer we come out with has a different name. You know, how do you come up with the names? Is it fun to come up with the names? And I would I would say that it's groupthink for sure, and it's 50% of the time super fun and 50% of the time super excruciating because sometimes we just can't decide on a single name. And having to, to name Liquid Escape, for example, was really difficult because that was a new flagship beer for us. That was a beer that we had to invest in the printing on the cans ahead of time, um, the, the marketing, the branding, working with our distri distribution partners at Premium to, to teach their staff about the beer. So you've got to commit to a name on that scale. When you're doing a small batch, it's only available in the tap room. You have a little more flexibility. Um, Reverse in, in particular was a name that our brewmaster came up with. Uh, he was home brewing this beer before he started professionally brewing it here at Virginia Beer Company. And it's got, it's got two backgrounds. So. Jonathan, our brewmaster, was actually an English teacher before he became a professional brewer. 
And he always jokes that the kids did not drive him to drink, but they drove him to found a new profession. And so he started home brewing on the side and then fell in love with brewing. He started brewing at Jackalope Brewery in Nashville and then went on to Sweetwater Brewing in Atlanta and went to uh, basically brewer school while he was with Sweetwater and then joined us at BBC. So Freeverse is an homage, for, first of all, to his background as an English teacher. It's a, it's a form of prose. And so just kind of a, a nod to his background and where he started brewing and what, what got him into the industry in the first place. And then the second part of it is kind of like Michael was discussing, it, it, is, it definitely leans towards the East Coast IPAs that are very popular these days that are hazy, unfiltered, have those kind of fruit forward flavors from some of the late dry hopping. But one of the hops that's in this beer is called Chinook, which is a little more of a West Coast style hop. And it, as the beer warms up a little bit, you get some pininess. It's not overpowering, but you definitely get a little bit of that bite on the back end to remind you that it is a, 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 a pale ale. Um, and so free verse kind of is a nod to the fact that it's not a traditional East Coast IPA. It's definitely not a traditional West Coast IPA. It's, it's somewhere in the middle. It's got, it's got uh, elements of both and, and it's a celebration of the traditional India pale ale style that was derived hundreds of years ago as the British were, were sending their beer overseas and wanted to keep that, that hop characteristic. So, um, it's, it's, it's fun. And again, with just like the, lo the logos, there's, there's a story behind every name, whether it's a, a broad story like that one or, or a last minute story. Um, well, I, I really love that, that background and kind of understanding where that name comes from. Um, and that's sort of the, the nugget that I went with to kind of think about what to, to pair with this. Um, oh, there's a nice pour. There's a nice picture of the pour. Ah, it's pour, pour, pouring hard. I will. I will pouring point out. hard. That's exactly how it should look. <laughs> um, so again, sticking with our kind of like otherworldliness, but also we're thinking off of free verse um, and and thinking about English class um, brought me to this work. This is self portrait as a sphinx, um, and this is actually just no under just hearing you um, think talk about the uh, it's not quite East Coast and it's not quite. You know, West Coast, this is not quite a Sphinx, but it sort of is. It's sort of like best of both worlds, right? So um, we'll get to kind of who this is in a minute, but just looking at the form, um, it's not only a sculpture or a bust or self-portrait, but it's also a functional object. So it's an inkwell. So in the front here, you can kind of see where the skull is sitting in her talons, um, and it has sort of a, a basin. This is where your ink um, um, or actually powder would be. And then in her head, I don't know if everyone can see the hole here. So this is where your quill would go. So if you can imagine sort of a quill sticking out of the head of this, um, this bust, um, and she's got some books here um, that are stacked. So, you know, if you wanna think about uh, writing your free verse about Halloween, you can do so with, with this inkwell um, and this sculpture. And like I said, it's not quite, um, a sphinx um, in the traditional sense, if there is a tradition of sphinx, but um, she's got the cat, the talons for sure, but she has bat, bat wings, which is not very traditional. And on the back side, you can see here, this is the rear view of the sculpture. Um, her back kind of flows into a fishtail. So she's sort of fishtail, lion, bat, woman, creepy. Um, um, amalgamation of all those things. And her name is actually Sarah Bernhardt. And that may strike a chord if you're, if you come from the theater or if you're um, affinity of the theater and you can see sort of the, on the sides here, she's got the tragedy and comedy masks on her side. And Sarah Bernhardt was, a, was um, really a larger than life character at the turn of the century. Um, this is a picture of her in her studio on the left with one of her works in the back. Um, and she did a variety of, of, um, of work, mostly figural, um, very expressive. On the right is a work called After the Storm at the National um, Woman for the Arts Museum. Um, and about 50 of her work, she did about 50 works, about 25 are known at the right now. So not only an actress, but also a really well-established artist. I mean, she exhibited at World's Fair and she won for the work on the here pictured after the storm, a silver medal. So she, she knew what she was doing in that realm as well. Um, and, and again, sort of mastered that craft as well as um, acting. But acting is what she is known of and, and known as sort of a personality um, and really cultivated this idea of personality. Um, 
not just as an artist in this photograph, but here's where we get really goth. goth. So she's also known as kind of the first goth. Um, so on the left, this is sort of a, a, a promo a shot of her in a coffin. This is not her deathbed. This is like her coffin <laughs> in her bedroom that she just had. Um, so she can be creepy. And then on the right, um, another image of her, and it's hard to tell, and I'm sorry, it's a little pixelated, but in the top of her hat here is actually a taxidermy bat. So I don't know if you can see kind of the wings here and the body, and she would wear this out, like walking around um, and was very well known for this. So she just like to attract attention to herself, um, you know, before like, this is like pre TMZ, but for pretty much the same purpose, right? To get noticed. <laughs> to, you know, make a scene um, and, um, you know, just gain notoriety that way. I mean, there was even a phrase um, at the turn of the century, kind of like if someone was being over dramatic, ugh, you're such a Sarah Bernhardt, you know? So it's, it's synonymous <laughs> with that. I'm going to use it on like my daughter later. <laughs> so <laughs> she's 10, you know, dramatic. So, um, so, so very, again, like this idea of just, she just expressed herself in very different in a, in a variety of ways through her through through the stage but also also through um visual art and just assumed the character she was portraying so this came after a play that she was in called la sphinx where she played a character that sort of um i, I would i don't want to say like the um anta i guess the antagonist in it um so, but loved that character so much, she wanted to commemorate that um, that role and um, expressing it in this this inkwell. Um, there are a couple of copies of this. It was cast a couple of times. Um, there's one at Boston, and then our version here um, at the museum. It is on view. So again, if you find yourself in the museum, go up to the decorative arts gallery. You can actually see this work, and then right around the corner, the necklace that I showed earlier, um, and compare this to in person. So kind of continuing on this idea of poetry, um, just as a nod to, to Free Verse's name, um, another work that I wanted to touch on, um, which also sort of is, can be scary. Um, this is a little different take, not as kind of Gothic, but definitely um, pre-Raphaelite and romanticized a little bit. This is um, a painting called The Cup of Death. You're not drinking that right now, I promise. Um, by Elihu Vedder. Um, and this was, um, a painting um, kind of version of a drawing and illustration that he did a series of illustrations to go with the Ruby of Omar Khayyam, which came out um, in the 1880s um, as a translation and really captured the imaginations of the American public. Um, this was a translation, uh, Rubia, um, the Rubia. Um, Khayyam, uh, the author, was a 12th century poet astronomer and it really celebrates the idea of um, meditation and transience and celebrating life, but also acknowledging and embracing death or the unknown, the other side. Um, and Vedder really um, clung to this idea and in his work as a symbolist painter really explored sort of the mysteries of life and, and mysticism. And in this work, he's illustrating verse 49. So I've, I've added that up there on the slide for you. Um, I don't usually orate, but I'll read it um, just in case um, your screen is small. So, and it says, so when the angel of the darker drink at last shall you find by the river brink and offering his cup, invite your soul forth to your lips to quaff and you shall not drink. So it's sort of fanning off this idea of death, even if you're tempted, right? Um, and in this work, death is the angel of death. So you see him on the right leading uh, the woman to that river bank, so as in, as in the verse. And she's sort of sleepwalking in a way. So it's sort of this, again, sort of this dreamlike kind of otherworldliness that he's exploring. Um, instead of being wide awake and kind of being forced, it's sort of what happens when we dream, what happens when we sleep. So this kind of freedom that we may find um, there. And Elihu Vedder, again, I just to give you, I always try to find an image of the artist, um, impressive mustache, but this is a photograph from 1870, so a few years before he worked on this, this piece. And the book cover is on the right, um, and you can see the drawings are all by him, as well as the book illustration. And these are beautiful illustrations printed 
um, just to compare the two. So this is how this, this composition looks in the book. And you can actually at the library, um, we do have the book at, the, at our museum library, so shout out to them. Um, and you can also find all of these works on our website, on our collection site, um, where you can actually zoom in and get a little bit closer um, to the works if you can't make it to the museum. Nice. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about our last uh -huh. selection. So um, I will interject really quickly. Earlier, Harlan had asked a question that I never answered, so I'll answer that very quickly. <clears throat> he asked, uh, why cans, not bottles? So I thought I would address that before we uh, move into the last yeah. year. Um, yeah, we, um, we made a very conscious choice to uh, move to cans. It's, uh, if you look at the trends in craft beer, uh, breweries by and large are moving um, almost exclusively to aluminum for their beer. Um, there are a lot of reasons behind the scenes of why that choice was made, but one clear reason why cans, not bottles is because Frankly, it is the safest way to package the beer for shelf stability and optimal freshness. And that's because the primary enemies of beer are light and oxygen. So by canning, canning beers in aluminum, you remove light completely from the equation. And then you just have to worry about oxygen levels during the packaging process. Um, not to mention there are extremely versatile as far as uh, travelability and versatility as far as where you can consume them. So that's my quick answer to that, uh, is that it's ultimately better for the beer to be packaged in aluminum versus glass, which lets in light to greater and uh, to varying degrees based on the tint of the glass. But with aluminum, that's not a factor. Did you want to jump in there? Anything I mean, that's, to add? that's a, that's a, you know, and I know there are people that prefer drinking out of a bottle versus a can, uh, modern aluminum is, is treated so that there is no, when the beer is in the can, um, you know, it, it comes out as fresh beer. It's, it's not, there's not, it's not taking any, it's not leaching any of the flavors or the properties of the can. Um, the industry has actually really come a long way based on the fact that so many craft breweries have opened. Uh, breweries of yore, you know, had invested in bottling lines and bottling lines are much larger than canning lines. Bottle, bottles take up much more surface area to store. So, the aluminum industry kind of had to rapidly advance itself to meet the needs of the craft beer consumer because, um, you know, the cans from 50, 60 years ago wouldn't cut it today. And so because of, of how many craft breweries have opened, um, you know, we've been able to purchase our own canning line. We've got cans and cans and cans stacked in the brewery. And then as Michael said, not just from a convenience standpoint and a modern um, kind of advancement standpoint, but also for the quality of the beer, you know, aluminum is not going to let any light in at all. And that's why if you look at a Corona bottle, for example, it's clear, uh, it's letting all the light in. And Heineken bottles are green, they're letting more light in. The vast majority of bottles are brown because that's the darkest tint you can go to let in the, the lowest amount of light, but you're still letting in more light than aluminum. So at the end of the day, for the quality of beer, um, aluminum's the, the, the best possible vessel uh, for storing the beer, for shipping the beer. Uh, and if you pour into a glass, you shouldn't notice any difference. Um, it really, it really comes down to that. We're, we're, we're promoting pouring into a glass where you can, uh, and you really shouldn't notice the difference between a bottle beer or can beer or even a, even a draft beer if the beer's fresh. Mm. And on that note, I'm going to jump right into elbow patches so we can move on to the, the next art pairing. Um, this is our, our dark beer. We saw, uh, often joke that um, every, every season is stout season <laughs> at Virginia Beer Company. We brew an oatmeal stout year round. Um, this is a particularly beautiful beer. Uh, I love it for a lot of reasons. Uh, obviously the, uh, the flavor, it is, it's delicious. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. Share, share the wealth. I don't like Sarah Bernhardt, but I need my beer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna say a couple of things about this and then quickly turn it over to Robbie just because this is a favorite of his. Um, but one of the things that you will note when you're drinking this beer that I want to point out, um, a couple of things. One, uh, misconceptions about stouts in general. Uh, folks uh, often assume that because it's a dark beer, it's going that equals or translates to heavy. Uh, that is not this beer. Uh, it's supremely drinkable. It's not heavy on the, on the mouthfeel or the palate. 
Um, and it's not heavy in ABV either. It's 6.2%, so it's extremely approachable. Um, the head retention on this beer is beautiful. I love, it's got almost a caramel tint to the, to the head. Uh, what a beautiful beer. We use flaked oats in the recipe, which give it a really silky mouthfeel, which helps provide some extra body to the beer without it being heavy on the palate. I think you'll be very surprised when you uh, sample this beer and how approachable it is. As a matter of fact, when um, new beer tenders come on in the tap room, or if I'm working with an account, a restaurant account that wants a beer training for staff and they want tips on how to sell craft beer or talk about it, I often encourage um, folks that aren't normal beer drinkers to not necessarily recommend the lightest colored thing on the menu. Sometimes it's much better to approach it from a maltier perspective and go the dark route because instead of uh, the other beers, uh, lighter beers, which tend to put the hops uh, center stage, dark maltier beers like stouts and porters really put the malt center stage. And our the roast of our chocolate malt in this beer uh, really comes through. You get notes of uh, coffee and dark chocolate that are perfectly well balanced in this beer and extremely approachable. And I'm going to drink now and Robbie's going to finish. <laughs> I uh, just, just one or two more notes. So the, the, the fun thing about brewing is there, there, there is a science behind it and there definitely is an education behind it. I mean, I know I go out to drink craft beer because I like craft beer, but also because I love expanding my palate and I love learning about different brewing techniques. And so for our four flagship beers that are always available, uh, the liquid escape is kind of a celebration of, of the sour side of brewing. Uh, free verse is definitely a celebration of the hoppier side. Our saving daylight citrus wheat is brewed with grapefruit and orange peel. It's kind of a celebration of adjuncts. What you, what you add to a beer that's not a traditional ingredient to really amplify the flavor. And then elbow patches is a celebration of malt and, and grain makes up the vast majority of every beer. Um, that's where the alcohol comes from. That's where the body comes from. That's where most of the color comes from. And elbow patches is a celebration of the malt life. It's a uh, chocolate malt, roasted barley, um, chocolate notes, kind of roasted coffee notes. And then the secret ingredient, which I don't mind sharing is flaked oats. It's an oatmeal stout. It literally has oats in it. And that's what gives it that soft, creamy body. So if you have a Guinness on tap, Guinness is poured with nitro. So it's, it's thinner bubbles. Um, it, it's a, a smoother, softer feel. We, we carbonate elbow patches the traditional way with, with CO2. And, um, you know, it's still very smooth because of those flaked oats. So different ingredients get you to different results and just because it's so dark uh, does not mean it's heavy like michael said it's, it's my personal favorite i love the name which has an interesting backstory uh but it, it's just it's a, it's a wonderful easy to drink dark beer um great for any time of year it's our most award-winning beer it's won awards in europe australia japan um and here in the states so it's, it's a really well-received beer which is also kind of ironic because it's probably our simplest recipe in terms of fewest ingredients um, and ease of the brewing process in terms of turning it around from uh, grain to glass, as our brewmaster says. And if you're looking for an opportunity to, to uh, pair, uh, pair beer throughout the day uniquely, it's a beautiful selection for a breakfast beer. I highly recommend it. Pairs well with pancakes. <laughs> Please enjoy. Tomorrow is Saturday, so. Right. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh just questions and comments about this beer. So I think, I think you are right. It's definitely hitting a chord. So um, Althea says, I don't usually like stout, but this is good. And no wonder she likes it. It has, you said chocolate was part it's, of it. And it's, it's yeah. chocolate malt. So that's the cool thing. Yeah. It's just grain, but chocolate malt literally gives off chocolate flavor. Yeah. Um, and then um, Eileen asks, is there molasses in it? And you're right, it's lighter than expected. So, the, so there is actually no molasses, but there is definitely that, that hint of some of the flavors that molasses would add or, or even the note on the nose. Um, and it's funny because we do brew a porter every year with molasses and it's a collaboration with Mellow Mushroom. So Mellow Mushroom, uh, a personal favorite of most of our staffs. We have one here in Williamsburg. There are many in the Richmond area, one in Newport News. And we brew a crowd <laughs> collaboration with the owner of the Mellow Mushrooms here in Williamsburg and Newport News called Palmer's Porter. And we put molasses in it because molasses is rumored to be the secret ingredient in the mellow mushroom crust. <laughs> so we put molasses in that molasses porter and, and you do get a very prominent kind of smooth, um, kind of cloying molasses flavor from that beer. This one just has notes of it because of the combination of the roasted barley and the chocolate malt. Okay, cool. Um, 
And then where in Richmond can you get your beer? And I will say, um, aside from VMFA to go, because it is available. Yeah. These three selections are available at VMFA to go um, now. Um, so uh, you can get um, a, a mixed a mixed six pack or you know all of your favorite. Um, but outside of VMFA to go, where else could they find it in Richmond? Uh, so I'll jump in real quickly. I, I actually would recommend uh, stopping by the VMFA because of the, the option to do a mixed six pack. Um, if for whatever reason you weren't able to pick up the beers for today's, uh, today's presentation, but want to uh, circle back and sample them, it's a great way to try the variety of flavors that Virginia Beer Company has to offer without the commitment of diving into three separate six packs. Mm -hmm. So you should definitely do that. Um, if you are looking for um, our beer in other places, I would point you first to um, our partners at Total Wine. They have been great partners for us. They carry everything that we release. All four core beers are available readily and all the time. And they bring in everything we brew on a limited scale. So the 16 ounce uh, tall boy four packs uh, of, of varying styles, IPAs, double IPAs, um, some red, red ales, a lot of sours, anything along those lines you'll also find there. Um, and then more accessible, Freeverse, um, uh, Saving Daylight, our wheat beer, Liquid Escape, all of our core beers, you can find to greater and lesser degrees through all of your grocery chains. Freeverse is the one that's most common. You'll find that at Kroger, Harris Teeter, Publix, um, Wegmans. Uh, Wegmans actually carries all four cores, but uh, you can find our beer more and more popping up everywhere. And if you don't see it, if you are sampling our beer and don't see it at your at your favorite uh, stop to purchase beer, ask for it. It's readily available and uh, we would love the personal recommendation. I would love to sell beer to your favorite retailer. There you go. <laughs> well, um, Elbow Patches, um, looking at that kind of the darkest of the beer. Again, like we're talking about the dark side of, of things. Uh, I'm getting to spooky. So um, got to go into some um, Francisco Goya. So um, on the left is um, a self-portrait of Goya. That's the first plate in a series of prints, um, about 80 prints called Los Carpuchos. So the Caprices. Um, and Goya, um, you know, a Spanish artist, um, worked in the late 1700s through early 1800s and really started out, um, I guess, like a lot of his commissions and kind of traditional portraiture. Um, he started working for Charles IV of Spain and you see um, this family portrait here. But as you start to spend a little bit more time with this, um, things are kind of looking a little off uh, with, with these, this family. Um, they're given a lot of looks uh, to each other and to the artist. And you can see Goya actually in the background here um, painted himself in sort of working sort of a scene within a scene. And he's he's starting to give a little bit of caricature to the royal family. And this is going to be a note that carries on in his work um, where he becomes really a commentator on the atrocities that's uh, that are occurring in Spain um, and France at the time um, and really uses his art to really I don't um, comment, comment on this, um, sometimes in very subtle ways and sometimes in allegorical ways. And that's what happens with um, the Caprices. Um, and there are two um, selections uh, from Caprice, the Caprices that we'll take a closer look at today um, to, to go with this kind of dark element. So sip on your, sip on your elbow patches. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And we're going to look into these two, just, just, um, we're getting closer to Halloween. So yeah, I mean, and, and like that chocolate note and this kind of barley note, um, I, I mean, I wish I had it with me, but drinking in my office just feels wrong, but, but, um, <laughs> so we're looking at, um, uh, the sleep of reason produces monsters. And this, this is, this, um, might be familiar to a lot of people. It shows up a lot in reproductions. Um, and it's really, um, again, kind of like uh, the cup of death. So we're kind of entering this sort of dreamlike state, but instead of sort of, again, sort of a, a soft um, journey, this, this is really harsh and scary. Um, so we have the artist here in the foreground on an artist table, has fallen asleep doing his work. So you can see sort of his paintbrush here um, and he's sort of collapsed and is 
so we can guess he's sleeping. And that's what this says um, in Spanish, the sleep of reason produces monsters. And so we see these monsters sort of rising up in the background, um, sort of overtaking him. And is he dreaming this? Is it real? Um, and these bats and owls um, in Spanish tradition are symbols of witches and evil. So this kind of evil that's about to overtake him. And right over here, we sort of see this, this cat-like, it's almost like a lynx or a tiger sort of being startled in itself, um, not associated with these kind of creatures of the night. So hard to say is this kind of the conscious of the artist being awakened? Um, is this like his subconscious realizing what's happening, but his conscious isn't? Um, so um, again, kind of what is the role of the artist? What is he here to do? Is he to reveal the monsters that he sees around him, right? And the monarchy and politics um, and bring them to the forefront. Like that sleep of reason, right? Now he's reasoning is producing finally those monsters and revealing them uh, to us. So again, that duty of the artist to show the truth, even if the truth is scary. Um, and then we come to our hobgoblins. Uh, so um, in Caprichos, again, you can go online and see the entire uh, 80 prints um, on our collection site. So just to scroll through them. And I'm not, I did not, because there are so many, obviously didn't have time to include them all. And some of them are pretty raunchy. So I can't really show them at all anyway. But um, this one, again, with the sleep of reasons, which is very um, concentrating on that dark dark side with the monsters, you know, he's really exploring a lot of uh, the supernatural in this, in this collection, including hobgoblins, so Dwen uh, Citos. So we've got three hobgoblins here, um, and hobgoblins, you know, they're supposed to be kind of mischievous goblins, so yes, they look super scary. This looks like a scarecrow come to life, or like Freddy, it's like a mix of Freddy Krueger and a scarecrow with like a really big hand. I don't, so it just, you know, his imagination is kind of going crazy um, inventing these, these creatures. And I don't know, guys, is that elbow patches they're drinking? I don't know. <laughs> it looks like beer to me, like a really dark stout. At the very least, they might have elbow patches on their attire. There you go. There's gotta be something. Um, I'm sure Robbie's felt like that one morning after <laughs> excessive amounts of beer at some point. I, I certainly have. Um, and then this, like the the foot of this one is just really like at an odd angle. I mean, there's just so much like inventiveness going on. And like, I feel like these guys have been around for a while. I have a lot of stories to tell. Um, and it's really hard to tell actually where they are, They're kind of like in a dungeon or in the, like what this is in the background. So um, again, just getting really in the dark side of things was really um, where Goya started to head around this time period um, and really late into his career. Um, and this was right after um, he actually had a very severe illness that um, he recovered from, but as a result left him deaf. And so he, he worked in isolation for a really long time. Um, but I think that isolation also gave him that, that freedom, right? He wasn't kind of commissioned, but he more was working for himself. And that's where he started to really a, like focus on that his, his purpose, right, as an artist, but also being in isolation could also lead to a lot of kind of going down a, a scary path. So some of that is, is kind of that result. Yeah, Michael. I was just wondering, um, uh, did his work, was his work dramatically, maybe you're gonna touch on this, dramatically affected by that? Did it proceed to get darker and darker because of that or? Yeah, I, it did. Um, I, I don't know if it's a result of kind of going through that emotional and physical um, really transformation um, or sort of what was happening on politically and culturally around him um, that he that he got darker and we are going to touch on that so this is another this is a work that he is very well known for um, Saturn devouring one of his sons um, this is located at the at the Prado um, in Madrid and is part of a series called the black paintings and so in his house at outside of Madrid this is a, one of like six or seven murals that he worked on. They were all very much um, the macabre, like grotesque um, and very expressive and, and really hard to look at. And I, I don't wanna linger on this too much because it it's, it's a disturbing image and it's supposed to be. Um, it's supposed to be very gut-wrenching. And again, a commentary on, 
on what happens when you are scared of losing power, which is uh, what was going on with, with the monarchy um, at the time. Um, so Saturn, this, this legend is Saturn, there was a prophecy um, that one of Saturn's children would dethrone him from power. He was the god of time. And because he was so worried about that and consumed with not being in control, um, he figured the only way to do that would, would be to kill his children. So he, you know, ate them. Um, and, and one of them escaped um, and was able to dethrone him, his son Jupiter. So Saturn and Jupiter is where the, the planets names come from. Um, and Goya is really, again, using this as an allegory to talk about that, that the danger, the danger of pursuing power at all costs you know, and what that, that can do to a person. Um, and it's very um, painterly and very expressive. So we've moved away from this kind of, you know, when we look back at this portrait of the family, um, which is very, which is real, you know, uh, realism and detailed and, and textural and like lush and, um, very much on that kind of classical, like with an edge, there's still an edge there. Um, and then we, we come back to um, some prints that, that again, realist, but very imaginative, still on that dark thread. And then ending with this, you can really see that arc um, of, of really the depths like that he is thinking to, right? Um, towards the end of, end of his career. Um, and very painterly, so so all around the edges here, you know, it's really again darks and lights, um, but really slashes of a paintbrush, um, and that's why like a lot of people, you know, when we're thinking about the art history, right, European art history, uh, Western art history, that he is really very early 1820, like a modernist, you know, um, using that that paint as expression and slashes, you know, before before it really comes into vogue later. Um, but I don't want to end on this. Let's come back to our hobgoblins who are yeah. just having a good time, um, even though they're they're kind of a little creepy. Um, You're not talking about us, right? Yeah. No, right? <laughs> no not at all. Not at all. Um, so I would. Uh, so that kind of brings us to to the end. And I just I want to say, Robbie and Michael, thank you so much um, for sharing the story of Virginia Beer Company and these great beers. Um, and Afia, thank you, Afia. She she was saying she really loves looking at Saturn devouring, but she said, this has been awesome and so fun, but I must say, I'm glad I don't have to drive home. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's the beauty of virtual tastings. You know, you can do it from the, the comforter the of your own home. Lining of a global pandemic there is you go. imbibe from home and do it safely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I will say too, just, you know, and I hope people um, have a great Halloween doing however, if you choose to celebrate Halloween, um, you know, enjoy yourselves, look out for the hobgoblins and the sorcerers and um, don't drink the cup of death, but do drink Virginia beer. Um, um, and I've, I've learned a lot. I mean, I didn't know about you guys. So I really appreciate the opportunity to get to know you, get to know your beers, um, celebrate a Williamsburg based beer. So as a William & Mary grad, that makes me very proud um, as well. Um, and I wanna thank Chase, our sponsor, for bringing us Fridays after five um, and encourage you all our next taste of our programs. Um, South African wine and art will be our focus November 13th for wine. And then we'll come back to beer uh, with Stone Brewing Company out of Richmond. Um, because that's the day after Thanksgiving, we're gonna actually pre-record a conversation with us and then put that up to our YouTube page on the 27th. Um, this whole uh, program um, has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube page probably within a week. Um, but um, again, I just, just want to say thanks so much to you both for taking the time um, to be with us. No, this has been great. I mean, it's been a really fun process working with you to give you some uh, sneak peek into our brewery, our brewery and uh, kind of what makes us tick. And then watching how you took those stories that I told you and folded them into the selections that you paired tonight has been really fun. I, it's been a great experience and a really unique one. I appreciate it. Oh, you're so welcome. Yeah, and our, uh, you know, our, our company mantra is beer, people, purpose. And so we're all about using the brewery as a force for good and being involved in the community and, and promoting uh, nonprofits and the arts. And so being able to team up with the BMFA and doing something like this, even during a pandemic, um, just speaks to why we're doing what we're doing and 
brewing what we're brewing. And I know on a personal note that um, my, my wife is, has been a regular at Fridays after five pre-pandemic. So when she found out that we were doing this, I definitely got brownie points. She was like, that's super cool, man. That's so cool. <laughs> nice. Five is a great event. I hope you get to do one when everything's back to normal. So yeah. we're the, building the relationship and, and doing this again. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And everyone too, everyone will get a survey. So like, like Robbie said, you know, just like they like to hear from everybody about their beers and know what they like and don't like. Same here. So tell us what you enjoyed about the program, what you're looking for next. Um, for our next taste of art that focuses on beer. So thank you again, everyone, and have a great night. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers.